Hey everyone, Chris here with another filler video. Now, one thing I've been asked a number of times is to do a video related to programming. You know, to actually like show people how to get into programming, how to actually make stuff. But the thing is, that's a really involved process. And I don't want to make like a whole several, it would take like dozens of episodes to really get the point across just all the things that go into making like a full game and everything. But then I realized that Programming is still useful in terms of just doing simple things. So one of the best tools to get started with to just learn how to program in general is the original Microsoft QBasic. This thing was included with MS-DOS, I believe from versions 5.0 and up. I could be mistaken about that. It's actually, um, excuse me, QBasic is actually a derivative of Microsoft QuickBasic, which came out a few years earlier. And QuickBasic was basically, <laughs> no pun intended, it was supposed to be a new form of doing BASIC, because in original BASIC interpreters, you had to put in your line numbers, you had to do everything line by line, you couldn't instantly scroll through your program and stuff. The idea of QuickBasic was to turn sort of a text editor into a BASIC programming environment. And that was, I'm actually showing you guys Quick Basic on the screen right here, right now, because I have both Quick Basic and Q Basic. The difference is Quick Basic was a fully realized commercial product that you paid money for that has a whole bunch of features that Q Basic doesn't have. Because Q Basic is a pack in thing with MS DOS, it's much simpler to use. And chances are, most of you who have access to any sort of DOS environment probably have a copy of Q Basic somewhere, or even if you don't, Getting QBasic online is pretty simple enough. So, as you just heard me clicking my knuckles, because I'm doing this, doing this as I'm going, so you'll probably hear some mistakes, you might hear some background noise. The idea is, I'm going to show you guys how to make a QBasic program in as quickly as quickly as I possibly can. And I'm going to tell you guys every step along the way, so this is going to be a pretty rough around the edges video, but Bear with me and we will learn programming together, so to speak. Now I'm actually on the QBasic startup screen right now. You can either press enter to see the survival guide or escape to clear the box. The survival guide basically just shows you very basic things on using the program. So let's just look at our environment right here. It says untitled because we don't have anything loaded here. As you can see looking through the menus, this does not have anywhere near the functionality of Quick Basic. But most of it anyways so let's get started most people are probably aware with this little gem here where if I were to run this program right now it would basically just print hello world down the entire length of the screen multiple times over and I'll just keep going forever and ever I'm not actually going to run the program for the simple fact that I'm using DOSBox right now and Quick Basic's ability to break out of an infinite loop doesn't work in DOSBox. So if I ran this, I'd be stuck in that infinite loop forever. So we're not going to do that. Instead, we're just going to do that because we don't need line numbers in Quick Basic. And when we hit enter, well, nothing happens because we have to run the program. You can either do it from the menu here or F5 will do it. Shift F5 will restart the program if it's still running, but. There you go. Hello world, down in the corner there. I actually still have all the DOS box front front end stuff there, but what we can do is CLS, which stands for clear screen. Now when we run it, screen's nice and clear. Because if we didn't do this and we just kept running the program over and over again, it'll just continue to print hello world down the screen. Because every time we're running the print command, it's going to the next line. You could actually stop it from doing that just by putting a semicolon on the end. So now, yeah, it kind of looks a little weird that way. Anyways, I'll explain what that does a little later. Let's actually print some more stuff here. So let's clear the screen again. And let's go print more world stuff. I don't know. And we run that, and we get the two lines there. Now if we wanted them spaced apart, we could just use print on its own. Because the print command, with nothing on it, will generate a line feed. And carriage return. The, uh, the, the, it's technical terms. Line feed is when you move, move to the next line in a text console or on a printer or something, and carriage return is when you move the text cursor back to the very left edge. It's, they're, they're kind of actually on um, throwbacks to the typewriters. 
that were around in the 60s or earlier, I believe. But the idea with the typewriter is that a line feed is when you go up to the next line, and the carriage return is when you push the carriage back, because the whole thing moved. So yeah, print command by itself will generate the line feed carriage return and send everything forward like that. And as I said, you can use a semicolon, and that'll completely negate that, so we go like that. But we can do a lot more than this, for sure. Like, I mean, if we wanted to move it down a lot, we could just do the print command a whole bunch of times. Or, something a little more efficient is a neat little command called locate, which will literally put the text cursor anywhere we want. So if we wanted it like near the bottom of the screen and sort of in the middle, there you go. The first number here is the Y coordinate and the second one is the X coordinate. We don't actually have to put in the X coordinate, in which case it'll just assume that it's the left edge. But Y coordinate in the standard te text mode goes up to 25 and the X coordinate goes up to 80. And we can even do something like change the color. So if we wanted like, I don't know, like that. There you go. <laughs> the first number refers, it's EGA color palette and the EGA color palette has 16 colors to it. So the first number is the foreground color and the second number is the background color. So we can do it like that. It'll be very red. <laughs> Or we can even make it inverted. And that kind of looks like monochrome. And we could actually take a look at all the colors if we just use take advantage of variables. Now, so far, what we've been using are constants. A constant is when you have any sort of text in quotes or a number. Those are constants. They don't change no matter what. But if you create some text, like, say... I don't know, like that. This, because it's not in quotes, is now a variable. A variable can be named anything you want, so long as it doesn't interfere with an existing command. So I could actually make the variable called, like, print val or print color. But so long as I don't actually make it print, because if I do that, it's going to, yeah. It tells me I can't use that like that, so... Anywho, it usually, if you're not doing anything too complicated, you just want to use simple values. So, I don't know, let's just do C for color. And then we just put the C there, do black, black background. And there you go. So, that's color 3. If we wanted color 14. Or, we don't even have... Let is a command that assigns a value, a constant to a variable, or more variables and stuff. But you don't actually have to use the let command. You did in very early versions of basic, but here, you just have to do that. And that'll work. And that's how it actually is with most programming languages. You don't have a let command, so... But, by using variables, we can take advantage of loops. So, the typical... There's many different kinds of loops. We're going to use a for next loop. So we're going to do for... Um, I usually have a bunch of letters that I use for different purposes when I'm programming. When it comes to any sort of loops or iterations or any sort of throwaway variables, I usually just use Z. So for Z equal 0 to 15, because there's 16 colors in the EGA palette, so we want to go from 0, which is the first, to 15, which is the last. And then we don't need that. And we're going to do color Z0, print more world stuff, and next Z. Now, we don't actually have to have the Z there. We can just do next. It gets a little... I like how... You, I just like having the Z there, because when you start doing nested for loops, like if you had like four like several for loops all nested together, then it's kind of important to keep it all straight. And that's then it would be a good idea to do stuff like that, but normally you don't have to. That works just as well. And I'm also, you don't have to indent it. Like this would work perfectly fine too, just like that. But the thing is you want to indent just so it's more legible because this is a block in a sense. This command right here and is is like it's like um how's a good way to describe this um it's like bookending this is the start this is the end and then everything in between is affected by this whole loop loop as a whole so if we run this we'll actually get all 
16 colors. Well, technically all 16 colors there. It's just one of them is black, so it kind of blends in with the background. The EGA color palette itself is actually pretty simple to remember if you don't have it memorized. I actually have it completely memorized because I've been working with it for so long. But um, the way to figure out a particular color number if you don't actually know them is to think of them as bits. It's a four it's a four bit palette. So the first bit is blue, the second bit is green, third bit is red, and the fourth bit is intensity. So uh, you can see for yourself from the colors there. The first bit's blue, so when you go to the second bit it's green. The third bit is the first two bits added together, which ends up being cyan. Fourth bit is the fourth one is the third bit, which is red, and it's just sort of a binary sort of thing there. It probably would make more sense if you're an actual programmer, but that's one way to remember it if you don't know it. So this is all well and good, but let's actually do something a little more productive here. So let's get rid of all of that. Let's say we wanted to input a number. Well, there's actually a command for that. Input Z. And well, let's just make it N because we're going to do a number. And then we're going to say print your number is n. And it's going to automatically add that semicolon for us. Because what we're actually doing here with the print command is we're adding, is we're printing this constant and then ta ta attaching on this variable here to the output. And the semicolon is basically to separate it. So, and the input command here is going to ask the person who's using the program to type in something. In this case, it's going to be looking for a number because this is, there's different kinds of variables. We'll get into that in a little, but we're going to be asking for a number and it's going to print it. And let's clear the screen. So all this is going to be is a question mark. We just put in like that and there it goes. So that's pretty simple. We should probably like ask the person to put in a number. So please enter a number. And, uh, whoop. and then there it goes. Please enter a number, put in your number. There you go. Now, if we were to put in text, because it's a numerical variable, not a text variable, it's going to do this. Now, some of you may have actually seen programs do this before, where it'll be like some sort of text entry, and you put punch something in, and it'll say redo from start. This is why. QBasic, by default, or just the basic language in general will ask you to re-input your re-input what you were putting in if you put in something which can't go into the variable that you're trying to store it in. In this case, we were trying to store text into a numerical variable. You can't put text into a number. You can put numbers into text, but not the other way around. So that's why it's asking us for an actual number. So if you ever see that happen in a particular computer program, that's why. And you'll instantly know it was written in basic. Now, it would be kind of nice if we could have, like, the entry on the same line, like the question mark, like, right after number. We can actually do that. Right like that. Because with the input statement, if you have a constant at the beginning, it'll use that co constant as sort of the thing to come before the actual entry. So you see right there. Now if we actually, um, you can use a semicolon instead and that'll give you a question mark by default. But if you saw, if we use a comma, it doesn't have a question mark. So when we use a comma, we could actually put in whatever sort of thing we want. We could have a colon there. Now, that's all well and good, inputting numbers, but let's actually do something with the numbers that we're putting in. So let's say if we, want, we wanted to make a sort of making sure that you're inputting a number in a specific range. So let's say, please enter a number between 1 and 10. And now we're going to use a handy little thing called if. If is a conditional check. So you can check to see if a certain condition is true and then go to a particular line number or print a particular thing on screen or set a particular variable to something 
basically if is it's the con conditionals are basically the what drive a program so we're going to check to see if n is greater in, or equal to 1 and if n is less than or equal to 10 then print your number is n And what we can also do is then is else print your number is invalid. So now when we put in the 4, your number is 4. If we put in whatever that is, your number is invalid. Of course, it's kind of cumbersome having a line that's that long, so what we can do is treat the if command like a block, just like with the for command earlier. The only trouble is that when we do this, we have to have an end if. This ends the ends the block for the if statement because there's otherwise no way for basic to know where the end is. Other programming languages have different ways of defining blocks. Basic wasn't ever intended to have blocks in them, so that's why QBasic has to do all these weird things to get around that. But there we go, and that's definitely a lot more legible. Now, let's say we wanted to make this into a game, where we guess the number between 1 and 10, and see if we got it right. Now it gets a little more interesting. In older languages of BASIC, on like really old computers like a Commodore 64 or a TRS-80 or something like that, you typically only worked with integers. But here's an interesting thing is that on the MS-DOS side of things, BASIC uses floating point values by default. Now the reason why this is important, let's go to the immediate thing here. I'm switching between these with the F6 key. Immediate is a section in QBASIC where if you put something in, and then hit enter, it'll immediately do that and show you the output. So basically the immediate window is how you can immediately do something. So what I want to do is use the rand command. rnd is a command that will give you a random number. Now in most program, in most basic environments before MS-DOS, the, the random number generator would give you random numbers up to a particular value that you wanted. So if you wanted a number from, say, 0 to 10, you'd probably do something like rnd10. That doesn't work in QBASIC, or even um, versions of Microsoft BASIC before QBASIC. Because what happens is that the random number generator functions more like on a calculator, where it's giving you a random number, <laughs> even really tiny ones like that one, it's giving a random number between 0 and 1. That's a floating point value. That doesn't really help us for guessing a number between, say, 1 and 10. So what we need to do is manipulate this result into being a number between 1 and 10. So what we can do is, say, just multiply the value. So if we multiply this by 10, well, now we have a number between 1 and 10, except, well, there's still a, it's still a floating point value. There's still a decimal places. We don't want those. So there's another command we can use called int, which basically truncates the floating point value off of a number to give us just a whole, whole number. Whole numbers in computer terms are usually referred to as integers, even though in math terms an integer can be a floating point value. It's complicated. Basically, in computer terms, an integer is always a whole number, and a floating point value is a number that can have a decimal followed by whatever. Or it can even be expressed as an exponent. So, if we do this, now we're getting the numbers we want. Almost. We're getting numbers between 0 and 9, because we no, we'll never actually get 1.0 from the R&D function. So that means our numbers are going to be from 0 to 9 when we multiply by 10. So what we want to do is just add 1 to this output. And now we should be able to get, if we do this enough, 
There it is. So there's a 10. And we shouldn't be able to get 0 anymore. So, please guess a number between 1 and 10. And now we're going to do things a little differently. If n is less than 1 or n is greater than 10, then go to 10. Or actually, no, go to 20, and we're going to put 10 up here. Because remember, we can still use line numbers, and line numbers are important so that you can jump around your program to different parts of it. So, if you put a number in that's invalid, we're going to say, print, please guess another number. Or, nah, it's too polite. Um, I said between 1 and 10, stupid. <laughs> That's almost too that's almost too rude, so let's go with it. And go back to 10. Actually, let's print another line just to keep things nice and neat. But now, consider that if this doesn't happen, because the number is between 1 and 10, it's gonna go to the next line. So I'm gonna say print. You guessed N. Maybe put a colon there. Now we're going to take what we put down here and we're going to stuff that into another variable. I like to use j for random numbers. So j equal int random times 10 plus 1. Okay. Print. My number, excuse me, my number is j. And we're going to do one more if statement here. If j equals n, then print, you guessed right. Else, print, sorry, you lose. Or lose. Something like that. <laughs> I don't know. Of course, Here's the interesting thing, is that if we don't do anything, like, once it does this, it's going to go to the next line, next line, next line, it's going to suddenly do this, and then go back up to 10. So we're going to put end here. This will end the program. Now, there's actually another way to do this. There's also a command called system. In QBasic, end and system pretty much do the same thing. But in older basic environments, end would simply end the program and return you to the interpreter, Whereas system would actually close the interpreter and bring you back to whatever operating system you were using. But it doesn't really matter here. So we'll just go N and let's run. So please guess, please guess the number between 1 and 10. Uh, that. It said between 1 and 10, stupid. Okay. 3. You guessed 3, my number is 8. Sorry, you lose. Aw, let's do it again. Let's say 9. No, his number is 8 again. Let's say 4. Well, his number's 8 again. Well, let's say 8 then. His number's 8 again. You guessed right. Notice how the number is always 8. There's a reason for this. You see, there's no such thing as a totally random number in terms of just raw computing. It can't be done. To have pure randomness, you have to have some sort of source that cannot be predicted. In electronics terms, there's not really a lot of options for that. Like, I mean, you could hook into, like, a, the feedback from a radio antenna or something, but most computers aren't going to have something like that. So what happens is random number generators are actually pseudo-random. So they generate a sequence of random numbers that they appear random, but they really aren't. The thing is that this sequence has to be seeded. And in QBasic, whenever you run a program, there's a default seed in place. So the sequence is always going to be the same unless you put in your own. So if we put in that, and now we guess the number between 1 and 10, his number is 7. But the thing is, it's, now it's going to be 7 every time. Thankfully, QBasic has, also has a nice little value called timer. If we actually look at the help here, 
we can see that timer in and of itself is actually returning the number of seconds that elapses. Or, hang on, this is actually the wrong one. Because <laughs> timer can be used as both a command and as a function. We're using it as a function, so it returns the number of seconds elapsed since midnight. And we can actually see this in the immediate window here. So right now it's 52,409.13. Do it again. So it's actually returning a decimal value too, and that helps too with the seeding. So by seeding the random number generator with the timer value, now we can have numbers that are random enough to our taste. So let's say two. Oh, it's eight again. Let's say eight. No, it's nine. See, now it's different every time. So now I have no idea what it's going to be. Whoops. Oh. Err. Come on, it can't be that hard. It's only a 1 in 10 shot. There we go. <laughs> so we just created a basic game right here. In 14 lines of code. Well, technically 13 because we got a blank one here, but whatever. This is all well and good, though, but let's do something a little more practical. Okay. Let's write a program that will actually help us do something in terms of making games. I'm going to write a program, and I'm going to write it twice, but I'm going to write a program that will take a damage value, an energy value, and a rapidity value, and for, like, say, a weapon of some sort, and, like, a shooter or something, and then turn that into damage per second, energy per second, and damage to energy ratio. The reason this is important is because in terms of any kind of game design, you kind of want to balance all of your weapons and stuff out. So knowing these kinds of values can really help you do that so that you're not just putting in arbitrary values and then ending up with weapons that are like horribly unbalanced and not fun to play with. And damage and energy values are kind of pretty pretty universal, and pretty much every shooter has some level of rapidity going on. Rapidity being how often your weapon fires. So we're going to write this program twice. I'm going to write it once the quick and dirty way. The way you would do it if you wanted to do this like really quickly, you only had a few minutes to spare, and you wanted to start getting some hard data for your design docs. But I'm also going to do it a second time to show you a more user-friendly way of doing it, and we'll show, I'll show you guys how to use some more trickier commands, because <laughs> you can do a lot with Cubase. I'll just go quickly show you here the um, the index. These are all the commands and functions that you can use in QBasic. As you can see, it's a lot. We're not going to be using all of them, but <laughs> let's do some stuff here. So, let's say we need, our, we need a damage value, an energy value, and rapidity. So, Clear the screen. Input. Damage per shot. And we're going to make that damage. Input energy per shot. We'll make that energy. Input shots fired per second. And we'll make that rapidity. So as I told mentioned before, you can make your variables anything you want, so long as it doesn't interfere with an actual command name. So damage, energy, and rapidity, perfectly valid variable names. So what we're going to do is dps damage per second equals damage... Now is this... Sorry, I had to... <laughs> blanking out for a second here because I'm trying to talk and do math at the same time that doesn't work. So permit me to be quiet while I figure this out. <laughs> Damage times rapidity. Because it would be divide if we were going from per second to per shot. And then energy times rapidity. And then the ratio um, will just be but we can do this one of two ways, right? So we can either make it like show the ratio so that it's the amount of energy compared to damage, or we can show it as the amount of damage compared to energy. So, eh, 
Let's do energy used per amount of damage. So that would be something divided something divided by something. <laughs> There we go. Now we just do print to give us an extra line. Print damage per second. DPS. Print energy per second. EPS. And print energy used per damage. And that'll be our ratio. And that's it. That's our little program right there. So damage per shot, 100. Energy per shot, 100. Shots fired per second, 4. 400 damage a second, 400 energy per second. Energy used per damage, 1. Let's run it again. Say damage per shot is 25. Energy per shot is 75. Shots fired per second is 8. 200 damage a second, 600 energy per se second, and 3 energy used per damage. Or it may be better to actually put this as damage energy ratio. And then what we can do is so show a 1 followed by the ratio. So if it was like 100, 200, 4. Of course, having the space in that number there is kind of annoying. There's multiple ways to get around that. The simplest way is to just convert the number into text with the string dollar sign command. So now when we do this again, 25, 50, 4, there you go. Um, okay, that didn't quite work. The reason why there's a blank space there is because that's where the negative sign would go. So let's actually also use L trim dollar sign. So <laughs> it's a bit of a bit of a mess. String dollar sign is converting a the a numerical numerical variable into a string variable. An L trim dollar sign is trimming off any left edge spaces from a string. So now, let's try this one more time. There we go. So now that space is finally gone. So this is the most this is the most basic way you could do a program like this. And we could even do something like this, where it's like input do another calculation y n <clears throat> comma now this has to be a string value because we're typing in a letter on the we're typing in text now so normally i like to use s dollar sign Basically, when you put a dollar sign on the end of a variable, it's telling QBasic that you want it to be a text variable. And there's actually different symbols you can put on the end of variables to make them different kinds of storage. But in this case, we want text, so a dollar sign. And if, um, what was S dollar sign <laughs> equals Y, and I forgot line label. Let's just do like this. I'll actually put a print right here. So if s dollar sign equals y, go to then go to 10. Otherwise, program ends. Of course, we want to detect for both. What if the person puts in a capital Y, right? Like, I mean, let, let me show you what happens here. Because text, everything is case sensitive here. Well, Everything is case sensitive when it comes to variables. So if we put in our calculations here and whatever, and it says do another calculation, if we put in a lowercase y and hit enter, we can do another calculation. Fair enough. But if we put in a capital Y, it doesn't work. Because we're only detecting the small y. So we could either do it like this, That's one way, or we could do it like that, because L case dollar sign returns the lowercase very the lowercase result of a string. So 
even if you put in a lowercase y, it would still be a lowercase y. Or you could even do u case, which is the uppercase variant of a string. And there you go. So now when we do whatever and put in a capital Y, it still works. And the reason why I put in the reason why I put in a capital N here, this is sort of like an old style convention where whichever value is capitalized is the default value if you don't put in any of the other letters. So we capitalize the N because if you don't put in a Y, program just ends. So this is our basic program for turning energy per shot and damage per shot and shots fired per second and giving us damage per second, energy per second, and the damage to energy ratio. Now let's do this a bit more user friendly ish. If you have any intention to use your program for more than just a few minutes, you probably want to make it at least a little user friendly. So what we're going to do now is make a much more user-friendly version of our little damage program there. This will be a little more trickier to show you guys every step of the way, but I'll do what I can. So I'm going to clear the screen, print, let's actually make this look a little good too. So color 14, 1. Also you can use colons like that to bridge to multiple commands onto the same line. So what I'm doing here is printing damage or DPS, EPS, calculator. That's essentially what it's going to be doing. By me. Uh, space that a little. So yeah, we could do this like this, but I like having colors and text that I intend to display on the same line, so and there you go, and that shows up at the top like that. Now, color 15, 0, print again. Now let's actually, well first we probably want to set up our variables ahead of time. So we're going to set, we're going to give a default damage of 100. We're going to give a default energy of 100, and the ratio will obviously be, damn it, was it energy or? Oh no, we need rapidity, and rapidity will give a default value of 4. Then DPS will be damage times rapidity, EPS will be energy times rapidity, And the ratio will be DPS divided, was it energy divided by? Energy divided by damage. And technically we could actually just divide the energy by, the, we could just do this. We don't have to go with the DPS values, but whatever. <laughs> Anyways, so we're, we're setting up our variables ahead of time so that they're all nice and prepared for what we're about to do. So let's move on here. So for this part of the program, we're going to locate to 3, 1, because we absolutely want the cursor to be there. You'll see why later. And there's actually another variable I need to set up right now. And I'm calling it cell. We're going to set it to 0. This will make, this will make sense really quickly, because the previous program we wrote, we were just using input to input our var values, but this time we're going to use the arrow keys. Yeah, we're getting fancy here. So what we want to do is if cell equals zero, then color 14, 4, which will be yellow on a red background else color 15 0 then print damage per shot equals damage and 
And we're actually going to... There's a bit of a reason why I'm doing this. Because <laughs> you see... Let me show you guys something here. Let's clear the screen. Uh, let's clear it to black. <laughs> okay. If I were to print something and with a particular background color going on, so the 14.4 that I wanted to use, if I print this line right here equals 412, it's going to say this line right here equals 412. If I locate back to that position without clearing the screen and print something of a smaller value like say I don't know 19 notice that the 2 is still there so what I'm effectively doing with what I just did right there is if I do this and now just do color 15 0 print whatever, blank space, notice how the twos disappeared. Because the cursor position was now on where that two was, because I used the semicolon to avoid getting the line feed. So that's essentially what this is, because we're not going to be clearing the screen all the time. Clearing the screen can cause flickering, so I kind of like to avoid that. And in fact, we can actually just do that. <laughs> Have it all on one line. I like, ha when, I like having things on one line when it really does come down to doing one line of stuff. So we're going to copy paste this because we need three selections. And that's what cell stands for, is selection. Because we want to do energy per shot as well. And shots per second. Now let's actually space this out a little. So if we run this just as it is, oops, excuse me, uh, locate 4, 4, and locate oops, 5, 4. Okay, because I wanted it to be a little indented there. So as you can see, damage per second, shot energy per second, shots per second. There is an extra space at the end there, so I'm going to add an extra space to this stuff just to make it look a little nicer. There you go. Then we're going to locate to 7, 2, color 9, 0, print. Now here's the thing. I could do a line like this. Which will look like that. And I just realized I located one line too low. Uh, yeah, let's keep it on 7. So we can either do a line like that, where it's got all those little dash marks in it, or QBasic has this handy little section in the contents called the ASCII character codes. And we can see that the horizontal line code is 196. Now an interesting thing that you can do on most DOS computers is if you hold ALT and punch in a number you can get the exact character ASCII character you want so I just punched in 196 and I got that one one of the common one of the common ones that people might know is if you wanted to like say Pokemon but that's supposed to have that little it's supposed to be that special E that's actually 130 and you just hold ALT and you punch in 130. Now here's the interesting thing though. I'm doing it right now, but it's not working. You have to do it with the numeric keypad. It doesn't work with the number of keys at the top of the keyboard. But in any case, that's how I got the actual line code right there. And then I could just copy and paste that to get the line I want. And 
And there we go. Nice solid line. Although, let's actually make it green. Yeah, green works. Okay. Locate nine four. Color. Uh let's just keep it white. Print. Damage per second equals DPS. And here, because we're not changing any color values, I'm just gonna add the space like that. Copy paste. And we need to we keep needing to locate because of the fact that we're we're not all the way up to the edge. Like I mean, I guess what I could do since we're not changing the colors is just add the extra space. That should work. Yeah. Okay. So energy per second and damage to energy ratio. One, two, L trim, dollar sign, string, dollar sign, ratio, like that. And there you go. So we've got the beginnings of our little program here. Now, let's do another one of these little things. Actually, we could have done this right at the start, so let's do it here. We don't actually need another color one, we just need to locate. So locate 25 1, right at the bottom of the screen. And we're going to see arrow keys to adjust values. And press escape to quit. There's one problem with this. Yeah. Notice how it sort of scrolled the screen like that. Line feeds have an interesting effect near the bottom of the screen. So we need to make sure that a line feed doesn't happen by adding a semicolon here. And now we can't see it anyways, because... We can just use sleep and that'll allow us to see it. It's still scrolling the bottom of the screen though for some reason. Might be that the line's too big. No, I can't. It doesn't. Hmm. Oh, because we have the print command right there. Duh. <laughs> there we go. So now we actually have things on the top and bottom. So it actually looks like a program that you could actually do stuff with, but we can't actually do anything with it yet. So, let's make it so we can actually do something. So QBasic has this interesting little command called inkey dollar sign. Inkey dollar sign is basically a function that returns a text string of the last key pressed on the keyboard. If no key was pressed on the keyboard, it just returns a null string. A null string is basically a string with nothing in it. Now, remember how I said we wanted to use the arrow keys? This presents an interesting conundrum, because in key dollar sign returns the actual character of the key you pressed. So if you press W on the keyboard, it would either give you a little W, or a big W if you had shift down or caps lock on. Or you could push 7 and get a 7, you could put, put in a plus symbol and you'd get a plus symbol. All well and good. There aren't technically arrow characters. Like, I mean, okay, if we go to the contents, we go to the character codes, yes, there are technically arrow characters, but they're part of the escape sequences. The escape sequences are the first 32 characters in the ASCII character table. You don't normally, you're not normally supposed to see those characters. So, you can't actually use them. <laughs> These do not show up when you push the arrow keys. 
Like, I mean, what if you're pushing something like F7? You're not going to see F7 come up. It's a character. Cubase handles this in a weird way by giving... Whenever you press a character on the keyboard that's not a character key, it'll pr- put a value of a... It'll put a blank value in the first character slot for the string, and then the second character slot will be a character based on what the key press is. Now, I happen to have this memorized after years of doing this. The up arrow is equal to that. The down arrow is equal to that. The left arrow is equal to that. And the right arrow is equal to that. That just come. That it's not. That's not something you would know. <laughs> that's something you would have to experiment and try out and eventually figure out on your own. So, yeah, H is up, P is down, K is left, and M is right. So, because I know that, we can use the arrow keys. So, what we're gonna do is do. We're gonna actually do another loop, kind of loop here. It's a do while loop. A do while loop is a a for loop was one that iterates. So we were saying for z equals 0 to 15 because it would increase z by 1 every time it did the loop. A do while loop instead will loop forever until a particular condition is met. So what we want to do is do a dollar sign, which is our own variable, equal in key dollar sign. And we're going to loop while a dollar sign equals nothing. And that's how you do a null string in QBasic, is just two quotes. And now we're going to check the value of the string. Of course, checking the second character is interesting. I don't actually... I've, this is the way I've done it since forever. There's probably easier ways to do this, but this is how I do this. Is if the middle character, and this is a pretty complex function here, mid dollar sign gives you the middle section of a string based on where you want it to start and how many characters you want. So in our case, we want the middle, a midsection of a dollar sign starting at the second character and only one character long. If that's equal to H, we're going to go to 10. We're going to copy this four times here because we need one for each direction. Let's go to 20, 30, and 40. And we're going to set those up in a bit. Now, the escape key is another interesting one because that one, it's like, what character is that even going to be? Well, again, if we go back to the contents here, remember how I said that the first 32 characters are escape sequences, and it actually tells you in the brackets what they are. Zero, for example, is the null character. Seven is actually the bell character. So if this, if you were to actually put this, char- this se- character sequence in on a console or something, it would generate a noise. That's what the that's what would generate the beep sounds in an operating system. Eight is backspace, nine is tab, ten is line feed, thirteen is carriage return, so the enter key. And escape happens to be twenty-seven. So what we can do is if a dollar sign equals care dollar sign twenty-seven, care dollar sign returns the ASCII character of the number that you put in. So under those conditions, then go to, I don't know, 999. (laughs) Also, you may have noticed that then is missing from here. You can actually omit then anytime you're using go to. However, for everything else, you have to have then in there, so. It's just good practice to keep using then, even when you're only using go to. However, if none of this is the case, then we just want to go back to three. Now, ten. Ten is our up arrow. Our up arrow needs to cycle our selection upwards, but we only have three selections. So the way we're going to do it is cell equals itself minus one. 
So what that's going to do is it's going to take the current value of cell, it's going to subtract one from it, and it's going to store the new va va value back into cell. So cell is going to equal itself, but one less. If cell equal if cell is less than zero, because zero is our lowest value, then cell equals two, which is our highest value. And go to two, because two is where we start doing all the printing of this stuff. 20. Pretty much the same thing, except the other way. Cell equals cell plus one. If cell is greater than two, then cell equals zero. And go to two. And I'm going to quickly put 999 in here so we can test all this out. So color 15. 7 actually happens to be the default color in DOS. So color 70 CLS and end. So if we run this program now, oh, it's going to complain because I don't have 30 and 40 defined yet. So let's just do 30, 40, done. Okay. <laughs> so there you go. I can use the arrow keys to change which value is selected. This is easy. This is, I, I'm making it look easy. It does take a bit of practice to be able to do stuff like this as quickly as I'm doing it, but this is stuff anyone can learn. And you're going to see in a second just how powerful this is going to get. 30. Now this is where things get interesting because we have three different things we could be selecting. So I'm going to introduce you to one of the most powerful commands in QBasic. Select case. Select case is basically something where you can execute different sections of code based on a condition. It's kind of like an if statement on steroids. <laughs> You'll see what I mean in a second here. Select case. And we're going to select it based on cell. Now, this is a block function, so we have to have an end to it. So case, zero. Case zero means we're selected on the damage value. So let's say increments of five for the damage and the energy values. So damage, well, first of all, we don't want to go below a certain minimum. Otherwise, things might get a little weird. So if damage is greater than 5, then damage equal damage minus 5. Right? Okay. Case 1. If damage is less than, uh, let's say, an upper limit of 1,000, then damage equal damage plus 5. Or hang on, it's, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing this wrong. Case one is the energy, because we're doing the left arrow key right now. So, in this case, we're affecting energy. So we just change all of this. And case two. Case two is our rapidity. Now the interesting thing here is that rapidity is a value that we probably want to adjust in as decimal points, but if we start adjusting as a decimal value, we're very liable to start getting start getting sort of an error margin going on. So instead of having like a perfect 4, we might get 3.9999999 or 4.00001 or something like that. So one thing we can do to get around this is first of all, we want to put our floating point value into an integer, but we want to multiply it up to whatever increments we're going to use. So let's say we're let's say we'll adjust it by 0 0.05 increments. That way we can do something like 3.75 or something like that. So 0 0.05 means 20 increments per amount. So we're going to create just a temporary variable. It can be any anything we want. We're going to say z equals rapidity times 20. Now we're going to say z int val. I forget, I forget what character this is, so I have to look this up. Because I'm doing something I don't normally do. 
um, basic character set. Because here's the data types I was talking about right here. You can see dollar sign as a string. I want a long integer just in case the values get really big. A regular integer only goes up to 65,535. Long integer goes up to like 2 billion something. So it's an ampersand. So int value ampersand is our variable. Int value ampersand equals C long Z. So we're converting Z into a long integer. And because it's C because it's a C long command specifically, it's actually going to do rounding. So that way it'll go exactly to the val number we want. Then we're simply going to do int val ampersand. If int val ampersand is greater than one, then int val ampersand equal int val ampersand minus one. And then rapidity equals C sing. Or is it double? I actually forget if QBasic uses single precision or double precision by default. I don't know. Yeah, let's just say double just for the heck of it. C double int val ampersand divided by 20. So a bit of a, a bit of a workaround here, but that's just to make sure that the floating point values stay nice and easy to work with. And then go to 2. 40 is basically going to be almost identical to 30, but with some obvious changes. Damage is less than 1,000. Damage plus 5. Energy is less than 1,000. Then energy plus 5. Do the rapidity conversion. Um, I'm going to say the maximum value here should be 20. So that would be 20 times 20 is 400. Okay, let's run it. Oh wait, notice what's happening. We're not updating our damage per second, but that works. We can go all the way down to 0.05, and we should be able to go all the way up to 20, which may take a moment. <laughs> but hey, it works. Yep, caps out at 20. So, that part's working. Now what we want to do is we're going to move this all the way to here. Well, actually, probably better to put it at the top here, so let's do that. Now, how about that? We can actually see our changes in real time. How cool is that? And that didn't take that much code. You guys saw every little bit of it as I was putting it in there. Now we could do some other things to make it even more advanced, like maybe adjust the damage value so that the damage value goes up if energy goes less. But you know, I think this gives you guys a good example of just how powerful even something as old as QBasic can be in the hands of somebody who just has even a marginal amount of programming skill. Like, yeah, I used some advanced commands here, but quite frankly, this is not that complicated. Any of you with enough time to invest in learning how to do basic programming in basic you could do stuff like this without going through all of this nonsense. Like, I mean, if you didn't know how to use mid dollar sign, you could just use like the letter keys on the keyboard, like the AWDS keys, like a gamer would. And then you could just say if a dollar sign equals a or a dollar sign equals W or whatever. And you don't have to know how to do how to use the do loop while you could just completely omit that and just do a dollar sign equal in key dollar sign and just continue to do this entire thing over and over and over again. You don't need this loop here, but I have it there just to save the 
saves the CPU from having to do that all the time. Anywho, I hope you guys got a kick out of this little programming thing. <clears throat> As I said before, this is something a bunch of people have asked me about, but it took a bit to come up with some kind of good way of doing this, and hopefully this answers at least some of your questions. Basically, if you want to get started with programming, this is the way to do it. Grab yourself something really simple like QBasic and just use it. You'd be very surprised how easy it is to just make it do just about anything. Well, just about anything within reason. Like, I mean, all I've shown you is text stuff. Like, I mean, you can access graphics modes. There's commands for drawing to the screen and stuff. There are limits, though. Like, I mean, if we actually look at the... Where is it? Right. Index here. There's no real commands for doing, like, advanced graphics functions. Like, there are commands for, like, blitting something to the screen, but it doesn't work like you would like you would think, like, a normal sprite command would. And, like, I mean, there's ways to access joysticks as well. I um, can't remember what that command is at the moment, because I haven't used it in so long. And, of course, you can manipulate things like the PC speaker. There's a whole thing with subroutines. It can get pretty complex, but I think I've shown you guys a good way to get started. So if you guys want to learn more, really the best way to the best way to learn to use this thing is to just go in, look up the index here, just hit enter on any key command that sounds interesting, and it will tell you what it does and will give you an example of how it works. And the best way to learn to do this stuff is to just learn commands as you go and figure it out. That's how I did it way back when. And, like, I mean, yeah, there's books out there and online tutorials, and that stuff is fun if you've got, like, a sort of end goal in mind, or if you want to learn how to do things in certain ways or learn certain methodologies and such. But for just, out, for just outright experimenting and learning from scratch, in terms of QBasic, just going at it is the best way to go about it, because it takes so little effort to just make anything happen. If you're doing something more advanced with something like C or C++ or Java or something like that, there's so many things you got to take into consideration before any program you write or even compile that that's when you would need a tutorial first. And you couldn't just experiment and hope for the best. But QBasic, go to town. Anything's possible. Just um, whatever you do, be careful with uh, anything that says um, call. <laughs> you can do some serious damage with the call of command, so I'd avoid that one. Everything else is fair game, though. <laughs> oh, uh, you probably shouldn't use um, rmdir either. Does that even exist in here? Um, make dir does. <laughs> uh, no, rmdir does too. Avoid this one. That'll actually remove entire subdirectories. <laughs> so... Everything except call it rmdir, you should be fine. Actually, is it possible to delete files? Mm, no. Okay. <laughs> so, rmdir and call. Avoid those and you'll have no trouble. Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Stay tuned for the next episode of Ancient DOS Games, which will be episode 181, which will be March... I'm looking it up because I don't have it memorized. March 5th, Saturday as usual. And as for the hint for the next episode, um, the only thing I can really come up with is that it was one of the last build engine games ever made. So, well, correct, one of the last build engine games made for DOS. So, send your guesses to ADG at pixelships.com and stay tuned to see what game this is and... Man, I suck at doing intro outros when I don't have it scripted. <laughs> Take care, guys.